reading, Rethinking Bezin, Ontology and Realist Aesthetics by Daniel Morgan. Critical Inquiry, Volume 32, Number 3, 2006, pages 443 through 481. The word, quote, realism, end quote, as it is commonly used, does not have an absolute and clear meaning so much as it indicates a certain tendency toward the faithful rendering of reality on film. Given the fact that this movement toward the real can take a thousand different routes, the Apologia for, quote, realism, end quote, per se, strictly speaking, means nothing at all. The movement is valuable only insofar as it brings increased meaning, itself in abstraction, to what is created. Andre Bazin, Jean Wenroir, 1973. The advance in digital technologies of image production and manipulation has seriously challenged traditional views about photography and film. In the main, classical theories of these media defined them by their ability to automatically, even necessarily, provide a truthful image of what was in front of the camera at the moment the shutter clicked camera, John Luke Goddard once remarked, is truth 24 times a second. Digital technologies, which allow for the almost total transformation and creation of images by means of binary coding, are thought to undermine the claim for the truthfulness of photographic media. The classical theories now seem inadequate and irrelevant. If we need to develop new theories to keep up with a rapidly changing media landscape, it is also important not to forget the ambitions of classical theories. Unlike much of the contemporary media theory, classical theories are interested in the kind of physical objects images are. They start with the idea that the nature of the physical medium is a necessary part of our thinking about the images it supports. By contrast, it is often said that digital images as such have no physical existence, that they are merely contingently attached to various physical bases. They are not things in the way photographs are. This view, I think, involves a mistake. The materiality of the image cannot be avoided. It is crucial to how we think about the aesthetic possibilities, circulation, affective register, and so on of images of any sort. In this essay, I am not going to offer a theory for new media so much as argue for the continuing value of classical theories of photography and film. They provide a needed corrective to recent theories by emphasizing the productive tension between the form in which an artist expresses subject matter and the kind of thing an image is between style and ontology. To make this case, I will take a careful look at the important work of Andre Bazin, whose intelligence and insight in grappling with the, with the difficult problems of style and ontology has been misunderstood and therefore mostly rejected. A more subtle interpretation of Bazin allows for elements in classical theory to emerge 
that are important for thinking about things however they are produced. Since the publication of the two-volume English translation of Kuesque, Ku, Kule Cinema, question mark, what is cinema, question mark, in 1967 and 1971, Bezin has acquired a canonical, even foundational, position in cinema and media studies. Such is his importance that there is by now a generally accepted standard reading of his essays. A film is realist insofar as it comes closest to or bears fidelity to our perceptual experience of reality. Dudley Andrew speaks of Bezin's aesthetic as oriented around a quote, deep feeling for the integral unity of a universe in flux, end quote. And elsewhere of realistic styles as, quote, approximations of visible or perceptual reality, end quote. Christopher Williams argues that for Bazin, film has, quote, the primary function of showing the spectator the real world, end quote which he, like Andrew, glosses as, quote, the aesthetic equi equivalent of human perception, end quote. Peter Wolin goes so far as to assert that this realism constitutes an anti-aesthetic, the very negation of cinematic style and artifice. Quote, the film could obtain radical purity only through its own annihilation, end quote. The standard reading spells out Bazin's conception of realism in film as a list of attributes, for example, deep space, the long take, and directors or movements, for example, Jean Renoir, Orson Welles, and Italian neorealism, that fulfill this function in an exemplary way. Two propositions lie at the heart of this reading. First, Bazin argues for a necessary and determinant relation between the ontology of the photographic image and the realism of film. Second, Bazin gives an account of the ontology of the photographic image that is best understood in terms of a commitment via the mechanical nature of the recording process of the camera to the production of an antecedent reality i'm going to argue that both propositions should be rejected the first has led critics to be satisfied with a thin and impoverished picture of his conception of realism a closer examination of more of Bazin's critical writings on individual films will expand and transform the parameters of our understanding of how his realism works. The second proposition misconstrues the ontological argument at the heart of Bazin's account of film and photography. Proponents of this reading have assumed that his arguments can be described in semiotic terms. Dispensing with, the, with, dispensing with this assumption allows a different argument about the nature of the photographic image to emerge, which will have consequences for how realism is understood. I want to first, I want first to explain why we should reject the standard reading of Bazin's ontological argument and focus instead on his claim that objects in a photograph are ontologically identical to objects in the world. Part two of this essay discusses the standard reading of realism and its relation to this ontology. While parts three and four set out my own reading of Bazin on these topics, I will argue that in contrast to Noel Carroll's caricature of a natural quote, entailment from representation to realism, end quote, 
PP pages or page 139, see also page 136, Bazin sees a more complicated relation between style and reality. Through a though a film to be realist must take into account or as I will describe it must acknowledge the ontology of the photo photographic image. Realism is not a particular style, lack of style, or set of stylistic attributes, but a process, a mechanism, an achievement. It turns out to cover a surprisingly large range of styles, even those that bear little affinity to the perceptual experience of reality. Part five considers two two objections to this argument. I hope to do more than simply provide a more accurate picture of Bazin's work. As long ago as 1973, Williams declared Bazin to be of interest only for historical and ideological readings. This judgment was based on and supported by an inadequate understanding of both ontology and realism in Bessin's work. I will try to show that by attending to the complexities of the relation between ontology and style in realist films, Bessin's position, properly understood, gives us a powerful and compelling account of the work realism can do as an analytic tool for film criticism. 1. The Ontology of the Photographic Image Bazin's early essay, quote, The Ontology of the Photographic Image, end quote, is generally regarded as providing the theoretical foundation for his account of film. The essay divides into three rough sections. First, Bazin sketches a psychology of art based on the historical origins of the impulse to make representations. He locates it in what he calls the, quote, mummy complex, end quote, where Egyptians sought to provide, quote, a defense against the passing of time, end quote, by allowing the, quote, corporeal body, end quote, to survive after death. Art emerges when this ambition moves away from preserving, preserving the actual body in favor of creating a representation of the dead person. Second, there is an argument about aesthetics, which investigates the realistic or mimetic telos inherent in the psychology of art. Bazin introduces photography here as the te technological development that, quote, freed the plastic arts from their obsession with likeness, end quote. Quote, O, oh, end quote, 1, 12. Third, in the section that lies at the heart of discussions of the ontology of the photographic image, Bazin moves beyond the function of photography in the history of art to the question of what a photograph is. The standard reading interprets the argument of the third section as providing an account of photography best understood in semiotic terms. Drawing heavily on the terminology of Charles S. Pierce, it generates the following picture. As a sign, a photograph mediates between the object, the referent, and the interpretant, the viewer. More simply, the image stands for the object in some relation to the viewer. Pierce presents three possible ways a sign can stand in this relation, symbolically, iconically, and indexically. Symbolic relations are determined by convention. Language is the best example of this. The word car only arbitrarily refers to or means a car.
Iconic signs concern resemblance, the capacity a sign may have to represent its object by virtue of likeness, a portrait, for example. Indexical signs have to do with a direct causal and existential bond between sign and object, a footprint, a weather vane, a bullet hole, pulse rates. On the standard reading, photographs are primarily regarded as indexical signs. Light reflects off an object and causes the photographic plate to react. A photograph's iconic properties are a function of its indexical status. I will call this view of the ontology of the photographic image the index argument. If the relation between object and photograph is indexical, three things follow. First, a photograph refers to an antecedent reality that is, as it were, quote, behind, end quote, the image. Suppose I am shown a photograph of a car, though I am tempted to say, quote, this is a car, end quote, or perhaps, quote, this is my car, see the dent in the fender, question mark, end quote. I also know that it's not really my car or even a car. It is an image or a sign of it. I cannot get into the car in the photograph and drive off. I cannot wash it. There is an ontological distinction between the object of the image, although the car is in some sense the cause of the photograph. They are not the same kind of thing. Our speech doesn't always make this distinction, but we know it to be true, or but we know it to be there. Second, the event or object to which a photograph refers is in the past. This is a general feature of indexical signs. A bullet hole refer refers to a past bullet a sailor's gate to years spent at sea. On this model, a photograph is a record of how something, an object, a scene, looked at a time the image, or looked at the time the image was taken. It is a direct record of a past state of affairs. Third, for us to read a photograph correctly, we have to be aware of how it was produced, aware of its status as an indexical sign. We believe that a photograph is an accurate indication of the presence of objects in front of the camera at a past time, not because of criteria of resemblance, but because we know how the image was generated. Our knowledge enables what Bazin describes as, quote, the irrational power of the photograph to bear away our faith, end quote, quote, O, oh, end quote, 114. If we understand the process of production, the fact that there is a direct relation between image and object, we will be able to say with certainty that what we see is faithful to what was there. There is evidence in the quote ontology end quote essay to support the index argument. Discussing the psychology of art, Bazin states that quote, no one believes any longer in the ontological identity of model and portrait end quote. La, la identité ontologique du modèle et du portrait. Quote O, oh, end quote, 110, a remark which suggests that he is thinking of visual images as signs. He then tries to categorize different kinds of images according to the means by which they are produced.
the relation between the image and the object it purports to represent. In painting, quote, no matter how skillful the painter, his work was always in fee to inescapable subjectivity. The fact that a human hand intervened cast a shadow of doubt over the image, end quote, quote, O, oh, end quote, 112. For this reason, paintings do not have a direct relation to reality. What matters is not that there is mediation, a photograph has that as well, but that this mediation is human and intentional. The sign in the painting is not indexical. Photography is different. Bazin claims that, quote, for the first time between the originating object and its reproduction, there intervenes only the instrumentality of a non-living agent. For the first time, an image of the world is formed automatically without the creative intervention of man, end quote, quote, O, oh, end quote, 113. The photographer has control over the selection of the object to be photographed and other factors as well, but not over the formation of the image. This makes the photograph an indexical sign pointing back in time towards its source in the objects behind the image. Bazin claims that, quote, we are forced to accept a real, or quote, we are forced to accept as real the existence of the object reproduced, actually represented, end quote, quote, O, oh, end quote, 113 through 114. Despite such evidence, the index argument, and so the standard reading as well, does not capture the main argument of the, quote, ontology, end quote, essay. What Bezin argues is something far stronger, more powerful, and in some deep ways, stranger. Immediately, Immediately after the comments suggesting a semi semiotic model, Bazin begins to develop a new set of metaphors. Quote, the photography affects us like a phenomenon in nature, like a flower or a snowflake, end quote, quote, O, oh, end quote, 113. Quote, something more than a mere approximation, a decal, or approximate tracing, end quote. Un decalique, approximatif, quote O, oh, end quote 114. We are getting a different picture here. A snowflake and a flower do not stand for an absent object, though either can be interpreted in various ways. For example, to tell what season it is, nor do they refer to a past reality. Similarly, Bazin argues, objects in photographs are in the here and now with a positive value. Quote, photography actually contributes something to the order of nat natural creation instead of providing a substitute for it. End quote, quote, O, oh, end quote, 115. Bazin introduces the notion of, quote, transfer, end quote, to elaborate this idea. He writes that with photography, there is a, quote, transfer of reality from the thing it is, or from the thing to its reproduction. I'll read it back. Quote, the, quote, transfer of reality from the thing to its reproduction, end quote. Un transfer the reality de la chose sur sa reproduction, quote, O, oh, end quote, 114. It is a strong claim. How does reality move from one thing to another, question mark, 
but it follows a logic in our ordinary uses of transfer. Power is transferred from one location to another. We transfer between forms of public transportation. We transfer money between bank accounts. We are transferred from one division of a company to another. In a grim euphemism, populations are transferred wholesale to new locations. In these uses of transfer, there is a movement from one position to another, the emphasis on the final destination rather than the starting point. Though a casual relation exists, recognizing the new position does not require a grasp of this relation. The rhetoric of transfer suggests a fundamental incompatibility of Bezin's position with the index argument. A photograph, Bezin asserts, has a closer tie to its objects than simply being a sign of them, even an indexical one. Thus, at the conclusion of the, quote, ontology, end quote, essay, he writes approvingly of surrealism's imperative that, quote, every image is to be seen as an object and every object as an image, end quote, quote, O, end quote, 115 through 116. The image is no longer wholly dependent on an antecedent object for its meaning. As Bazin works through his argument, the rhetoric of a, quote, transfer of reality, end quote, disappears. One might think Bazin sees a problem in the way transfer implies that reality goes from one thing to another. Does this mean that we should understand photographs as having a reality rested from the objects themselves? Question mark. It is clearly false that photographs somehow diminish the reality of the world. Bazin, in fact, more frequently uses the formulation of ontological, quote, identity, end quote, or equivalence, end quote, to describe the relation between object and image. Bazin now sets out what I take to be the central position of the, quote, ontology, end quote, essay, block quote. The photographic image is the object itself, the object freed from temporal contingencies. Libre de contingencies temporalis. No matter how fuzzy, distorted, or discolored, no matter how lacking in documentary value the image may be, it proceeds by virtue of its genesis from the ontology of the model. It is the model. L Proceede par sa genèse de l'ontologie du modèle. Elle est la modèle. Quote O, end quote, 114. End of block quote. The basic postulate of the index argument is here. The image is formed by a casual process that depends for its effect not on criteria of resemblance, but on the process of generation. But when Bazin says, quote, it is the model, end quote, how are we to understand that, question mark? No one argues that a footprint is a foot or that the barometer is the air pressure. Despite the fact that there is a direct non-subjective cash or causal relation between them. However, we want to describe what it is that Bazin is arguing and whatever we think of it as an argument, it is clear that we cannot account for, for his description of the photograph along the model of an index, indexical sign. It's not so much that the idea of ontological identity has been considered and rejected as that it has been ignored. This is a bit, this is a bit of a puzzle. 
given what Bezin says. I suspect it has to do with the sometimes confusing translation by Hugh Gray and perhaps with the fact that the idea seems on its face an uncomfortably strange one. But I want to take Bezin's claim seriously. Bezin's denial of ontological distinction between image and object raises an obvious question. What does it mean for an object in a photograph to be identical ontologically, not visually, to the object photographed? Question mark. Bazin seems to say that our desire to speak of the content of a photograph as if it were present to if, as if we were present to it, quote, she's in front of the building, end quote, quote, he's wearing a red shirt, end quote, C, or quote, C, question mark, end quote, registers not a temptation, but an ontological fact. There are several ways to describe such a claim. It could mean that a car in the photograph is the same car as the car the photograph is of, or that they are instances of the same kind of thing, namely cars. Or is it that the car in the photograph is real in the same way that the that the car in the world is real question mark it's not clear that any of these formulations or similar ones we could construct to make sense of Bezin's claim are coherent one might try to avoid such problems by describing the identity relation differently rather than speaking about ontological identity we could follow Carroll and try as a criterion the way, quote, patterns of light from the image are identical with the pertinent patterns of light from the model, which also served as causal factors in the production of the image, end quote. PP page 126. But this move has a number of problems such as requiring Bezin to believe that photographs of the same object taken with different lenses are about different things because they emit different light patterns. And Bezin maintains that whatever relation there is holds regardless of the way the image looks. There are two reasons not to dismiss Bezin's formulation out of hand. First, There are no easy solutions to these ontological problems that somehow misses or that he somehow misses. It's likely that the notion of ontological identity is a paraphrase of a claim about photography in Sartre's Light Imaginaire. L'Imaginaire. Quote, I say... Quote, this is the portrait of Pierre, end quote, or more briefly, quote, this is Pierre, end quote, end of quote. Bazin, as I understand him, is satisfied with Sartre's amb- ambiguous analysis as Sartre resorts to notions like, quote, quasi-person, end quote, and, quote, irrational synthesis, end quote. Second, Bazin is not unaware of the inadequacy of his own formulations in the, quote, ontology, end quote, essay. We find evidence of this in the sheer number of metaphors used across his essays to describe the relation between an object in a photograph and the object the photograph is of. Beyond transfer and identity, a partial list includes mummy, mold, death mask, mirror, equivalent, substitute, and asymptote. This proliferation signals 
in unwillingness or inability to give a clear, positive account of the ontology of the photographic image. The fact that Bazin continually shifts metaphors, that he never gives a sustained definition of a photograph, suggests that he never finds an account that satisfies him. Each metaphor captures something important about what a photograph is, but each fails in some way. The task of exegesis would be to figure out what goes right and what goes wrong with the or with each metaphor and why. In light of the particular films he is discussing, Bazin is drawn to it. But everyone suggests an ontology that is stronger than the index argument allows. Bazin's hesitancy and experimentation at this crucial point in his argument then should not be read as an evasion of the problems inherent in the model of ontological identity. His metaphors represent a series of attempts at understanding the peculiar ability of photographs to give us more than a representation, however direct and unmediated. Indeed, we might treat Bazin's situation as a practical example of what Stanley Cavell calls photography's ability to generate a condition of ontological restlessness. Bazin makes an important distinction within the terms of ontological identity. Although he says that the image is identical to the model, he does not claim that the two are identical in all respects. He says that the image is the object itself, but freed from temporal contingencies. It is easy to slide between the two positions. If the image is the object itself, it seems logical that they be identical on all accounts. But the distinction is important. We can see this in Bazin's claims that, quote, the photograph allows us to admire in reproduction the original that our eyes alone cannot have taught us to love, end quote, quote, O, oh, end quote, 116. The idea of being, quote, freed from temporal contingencies, end quote, implies the possibility of forming relations to objects and photographs that are not possible with respect to objects in the world. Bazin doesn't think, as Philip Rosen claims, that the photograph, quote, always provides the spectator with absolute brute knowledge that, that the objects visible in the frame were at one time in the spatial, quote, presence, end quote, of the camera, that they appear from an irrefutable past existence, end of quote. Bazin seems to be saying that photography moves the object from any specific position in time. The objects a photograph represents, or the objects a photograph presents may not exist in the present, but they are not exactly in the past, nor are they in any other time. They are real, but outside historical time altogether. If we go back to the phrase, quote, the photograph is the object itself, end quote, we get a fuller sense of the distinction being drawn. I take it, I take it that Bazin intends us to hear Kantian overtones in these words. According to Kant, we can perceive only what we can represent to our, mind, to our minds in space and time. 
These are a priori categories of the sensible intuition that we impose on every act of perception, not features of objects or the world as they exist outside us. Thus, Kant argues, we can never perceive an object as it really is, as a, quote, thing in itself, end quote. We can only know the external world insofar as it satisfies the general conditions of human knowledge, appearing to us in conformity with the constitution of our sensible intuition. Bazin is not arguing that objects in a photograph exist in the realm of what Kant calls the noumenal the realm of things in themselves, or that photography somehow grants us access to a metaphysical dimension. My purpose in making the analogy and so and for suggesting the importance of hearing in affinity with Kantian turns of phrase is to emphasize the extent to which photographed objects are for Bazin outside their embeddedness in ordinary perception. For Bazin, the separation is twofold. First, there are the general categories of space and time in which we experience an object. Bazin says that photography frees an object from, quote, temporal contingencies, end quote, but he does not say the same with regard to space. We generally see an object in a photograph located in a spatial context. Even in an extreme close-up where all we see is one object, that object still inhabits a space. A photograph does change something about space, but this has to do with this has to do with contiguity, contiguity to what is beyond the frame. Bazin's use of the image of an usher's flashlight as a metaphor for the contingency and instability of the frame suggests that Though it makes sense to ask what is beyond that boundary, there is no sure answer. The connection to a world outside the frame is, if not exactly severed, at least loosened. Second, there are individual habits, memories, and associations that we bring to perception, whether these are familiarities with the kind of object shown, economic desires, or other forms of attachment we might have. Bazin writes, quote, only the impassive lens stripping its object of all those ways of seeing it, those piled up preconceptions, that spiritual dust and grime with which my eyes have covered it, is able to present it in all its virginal purity to my attention and consequently to my love, end quote, quote, oh, end quote, 115. Photography gives us the freedom to form new associations, to have different kinds of relations with the objects in a photograph than we do with the same objects in the world. I take Bazin to have something like this in mind when he invokes surrealism towards the end of the quote ontology essay or quote ontology and quote essay. When he claims that in surrealism, the distinction between image and object or the imaginary and the real disappears, the effects run both ways. It's not just that images are accorded objective reality so that, quote, photography produces an image that is a reality of nature 
namely an hallucination that is also a fact, end quote, quote, O, end quote, 116. Bazin is also interested in the, quote, effect of the image on our imaginations, end quote, quote, O, end quote, 115, so that the kinds of things we do with or two images are applicable to our engagement with objects. It is this latter movement that Bazin embraces as the surrealist project. The new relations formed with respect to images are transferred to reality. Two, realism and the standard reading. For Bazin, the ontology of the photographic image is intimately related to his view of realism in film. Most tellingly, in a position he reiterates across his career, he claims that, quote, the realism of the cinema follows directly from its photographic nature, end quote, quote, TC, end quote, 1, 108. Such a claim, though, does not specify how the notion of realism should be understood or the specific way in which it follows from its photographic base. Proponents of the standard reading following on from the index argument have tended to understand Bazin's position literally as hinging on the resemblance or correspondence of a film to the world outside it. Carroll, for example, argues that, quote, Bazin seems to presuppose a view that realism is a two-term relation of correspondence between film and reality, pp. page 142. The film-reality relation, in turn, has been described in two ways. The first develops the relation in terms of visual resemblance, leaning on such remarks by Bazin, quote, as or as, quote, the creation of an ideal world in the likeness of the real, end quote, quote, O, end quote, page one or one ten. We can call this the model of direct realism. It emphasizes specific styles, or at least certain understandings of these styles that appear to refuse stylization, artifice, in favor of preserving the authentic look of the world. Henderson describes it as a process of, quote, coming closest to reality, end quote. See page 39. Andrew as, quote, closer and closer approximations of visible reality, end quote. MFT, page 139, while Wolin calls it the, quote, annihilation, end quote, of cinema. Behind the logic of direct realism is the presupposition that the world of, real, of a realist film ought to look like what was before the camera when and where the film was made. But this view, partly because of its reliance on the index argument, quickly generates problems. One of these is how fictional worlds can be supported on film. If we hold it to be the case that the image necessarily refers to what was in front of the camera, then, as Carol argues, we would seem forced to believe that, quote, M is about Peter Lore rather than about a psychopathic child killer. The creature from the Black Lagoon is not about a revulent off the Amazon, but about Wakula Springs, Florida. Films you thought were representations of castles, graveyards, 
and Forrest are really about studio sets, end quote, PP page 149. The world of a film needs to be separated from the look of the reality that caused it. Carol notes, quote, if it always makes sense to ask what is adjacent to camera images, we may arrive at some very screwy answers. Quote, what's next to the land of Oz? Question mark, end quote. Quote, the MGM commissary, end quote, end of quote. PP page 147. The coherence of a film's world is broken by the implicit presence of the world outside its fictional domain. Of course, it makes little sense if we respond that the MGM lot is next to Oz. The appropriate answer is the countryside, the yellow brick road, or whatever the film tells us is there. The question of what is beyond the frame of what is adjacent to Oz makes sense solely within the context of its fictional digesis. Its world, for all intents and purposes, is reality, a theory that cannot account for this aspect of filmic experience is in trouble. Bazin himself is careful to avoid the model of direct realism. Consider his discussion of a famous shot from Orson Welles's Citizen Kane, 1941. When Susan, when Susan Alexander tries to commit suicide in her room, Wells shows the entire scene in one shot. Block quote. The screen opens on Susan's bedroom seen from behind the night table. In close-up, wedged against the camera, is an enormous glass taking up almost a quarter of the image, along with a little spoon and an open medicine bottle. The glass almost entirely conceals Susan's bed, enclosed in a shadowy zone from which only a faint sound of labored breathing escapes like that of a drugged sleeper. The bedroom is empty. Far away in the background of this private desert is the door, rendered even more distant by the lens' false perspectives. And behind the door, a knocking. The scene's dramatic structure is basically founded on the distinction between the two sound planes. A tension is established between these two poles, which are kept at a distance from each other by the deep focus. End of block quote. Bazin's analysis of the scene draws attention to a use of sound that, combined with an image in deep focus, elucidates a specific relation between poles of dramatic interest. Wells' respect for the unity of space is the foundation for the shot's emotional resonance. Bazin suggests that the scene would lose its effect if broken down via montage into five or six shots. There is a tempting criticism of this analysis because Wells uses a mat. There are, in fact, three different shots superimposed in one frame. The glass, Susan, and the door. What Bazin treats as the perspective, or what Bazin treats as the preservation of the integrity of space is actually the effect of internal montage. His argument seems invalid. This criticism, however, presumes the terms of direct realism. Bazin does not claim that Wells is being faithful to an antecedent reality, but that he is producing an effect that allows, quote, an impression to remain of continuous and homogeneous, 
reality, end quote. OW, page 77, my emphasis. Bazin's interest in the shot and its emotional power has nothing to do with the faithful reproduction of a scene in front of the camera. His interest is in the effect the shot creates, which is based on the which is based on an impression, but only an impression of coherent space. Such analyses lead to the most compelling version of the stand, standard reading, what we can call the perceptual or psychological model of realism. Because it holds that the relation of a film's world to our world has less to do with visual resemblance than with experience, it is able to account for the problems of direct realism. Perceptual realism involves a reading of Bazin heavily indebted to a tradition of phenomenology. In a lecture that Bazin may have attended, Maurice Marleau-Ponty argued that, quote, a movie has meaning in the same way that a thing does. Neither of them speaks to an isolated understanding. Rather, both appeal to our power to tacitly decipher the world or men and to coexist with them. In the last analysis, perception permits us to understand the meaning of the cinema, end quote. A film's world, if it is to be sustained in the spectator's mind, must replicate the manner in which we experience our world. Bazin's love of certain styles and filmmakers is often cited as the justification for perceptual realism, such as his advocacy of depth of feel on the grounds that it, quote, implies a more active mental attitude on the part of the spectator, end quote. The spectator is not explicitly guided to what is important in the frame, but allowed, as it were, to make a choice. Depth of field, quote, brings the spectator into a relation with the image closer to that which he enjoys with reality, end quote. Quote E, end quote, 135. The use of deep space and the long take in Winrar's films, for example, are seen as techniques that are inherently realistic. Neorealism, another favorite of Bazin's, involves the use of real locations, non-actors, natural light, and an emphasis on contingent and ordinary events. According to this account, these films not only provide an experience of the world of a film that replicates our habitual way of being in the world, they employ styles that emphasize it. C, C, page 37, and MFT, page 157. Proponents of perceptual realism do accept the index argument. But rather than a strict insistence on a correspondence between a film and what was in front of the camera, they give a looser and more thematic interpretation. They suggest that because there is a direct connection between image and world on the model of the index, a realist film must aim at the quote normal end quote experience of the world. It's almost a normative claim, reading Bezin's insistence that realism ought to follow from ontology as a quasi-moral position. Bezin's discussion of the relation of the world on film to our world seems to support this view. He writes, for example, quote, <clears throat> 
we are prepared to admit that the screen opens upon an artificial world provided there exists a common denominator between the cinematographic image and the world we live in. Our experience of space is the structural basis for our concept of the universe, end quote. Quote TC, end quote, 1, 108, my emphasis. One might read, quote, common denominator, end quote, as involving, in the manner of the index argument, the material bond connecting film to world. Bazin means something other than realism here. It's not space so much as the, quote, experience in the, quote, the experience of space, end quote, that allows the world of the film to be held in place. This distinction emerges more clearly as Bazin emphasizes the autonomy of a film's world. A film is able to construct a world with its own, quote, autonomous temporal destiny, end quote. Un de ten temporal or temporal autonome, quote, O, end quote, 110. And, quote, the world of the screen and our world cannot be juxtaposed. The screen of necessity substitutes for it since the very concept of universe is spatially exclusive. For a time, a film is the universe, with the capital U, is the universe, the world, or if you like, nature, with the capital N, end quote. Quote TC, end quote, page 1, 108 through 109. I take Bazin to be suggesting that the world on the screen literally functions as reality, our reality, for as long as the film is being projected, for it to become our world, it has to allow us, quote, normal, end quote, modes of perception and experience. There are two basic, there are two basic objections to perceptual realism. First, Bazin does not describe the films of Renoir or neorealism as realist on grounds that they resemble the experience of reality. He not only rejects verisimilitude as an essential component of realism at various points coming close to directly opposing it to realism, he also explicitly, or he, he is also explicit that perceptual or psychological realism is an inadequate criterion for realism. See J.R. page 29. Second, Bazin describes as realist a large number of films that have little to do with resemblance predicated on the contingency, flux, and ambiguity of reality. Thus, the absolute white image at the end of Robert Bresson's Diary of a Country, Pre- Diary of a Country Priest, 1956, is called, quote, the triumph of cinematographic realism, end quote. Socialist realism is analyzed as a form of, quote, his, historico materialist realism, end quote, and Eisenstein is at some points acknowledged as belonging and contributing to a general realistic aesthetic. Ultimately, the problem with perceptual realism is not that it fails to describe what Bazin takes the world of a film to be, how it is constituted by the film and 
held in place by the viewer, nor is it that Bazin never talks about realism in such terms. The problem lies in its equation of the creation of a coherent world on film with realism. What becomes apparent when we look at more examples of Bazin's crit criticism is that the correspondence of the world of a film to our world, the cornerstone, the cornerstone of both versions of the standard reading is simply not the criterion for realism. Bazin will be interested in realism in films where worlds do not form or at least do not self-evidently form and where a world does and where a world does form realism will generally be used to describe something else getting an account of Bezin's view of realism requires taking a different route three Bezin's realism the difficulty of this task is that while Bazin's realism is oriented by the ontology of the photographic image, it is not determined by, the onto by that ontology and remains open to a range of styles and genres. As Bazin notes, quote, there is not one realism, but several realisms. Each period or film looks for its own the technique and the aesthetics that will capture, retain, and render best what one wants from reality, end quote. It will be helpful to be, or it will be helpful to have available a better sense of the way Bezin uses realism in his critical practice. Let's start with the discussion of Renoir. Renoir was one of the most important directors for Bazin, giving him occasions for insights into both individual films and more general theoretical problems. Here, too, a standard reading exists. Andrew argues that Bazin advocates Renoir's use of, quote, use, quote, of the long take of reframing rather than cutting and of shooting in depth because they sanction not only a unity of place and of action, but also a potentially rich ambiguity of meaning, end quote. MFT, page 159. Renoir's realism preserves the integrity of dramatic space respecting the manner in which we ordinarily encounter the world in its openness. It's not clear, however, that Bazin describes Renoir's style in such terms. Bazin does not treat the hallmarks of the standard reading, such as the long take, as having to do with the integrity of the depicted world. One of Renoir's celebrated uses of a long take, which is combined with deep space and reframing, occurs towards the end of Le Crime de Monsieur Lange, 1936. As Lange descends the staircase to confront Batala, the camera departs from his face and executes a counterclockwise pan of almost 360 degrees, moving in the opposite direction from Lang's walk. The camera takes in the entire courtyard. The camera takes in the entire courtyard, only to return to Lang as he comes up to Batala and shoots him. Bazin comments that while the shot quote has perhaps psychological or dramatic justification, it gives an impression of dizziness, of madness, of suspense. Its real raison d'etre is 
mo is more germane to the conception of the film. It is the pure spatial expression of the mise-en-scene, end quote. J.R. page 46. Bazin earlier defined the mise-en-scene of the film as having to do with the creation of a sense of the cooperative expressed in the establishment of a circular space, the courtyard, that serves as a thematic emblem of the communitarian politics of the popular front. The work of the 360 degree pan is to literalize and make explicit, give quote, spatial expression, end quote, to the thematic concerns of the film that are registered in the physical arrangement of its world. When Rar's film repeatedly positions Lange within the community, a theme emphasized by showing the entire courtyard at the moment when the dramatic focus is on his seemingly individual decision. The shot attunes us to the larger effects Lange's action might have. One very real possibility is that the community will be shattered, its unity lost, and its primary source of income, Lange's comics, banished from its midst. But we can also read the murder as an evocation of communal will. Lange is not acting on his own desires of jealousy or selfishness, for example, but on the desires of the entire courtyard. The point is not to decide in favor of one or the other. Both are there and I think not incompatible, but to draw attention to the degree to which Renoir's style gives a dramatic and spatial situation, its meaning. It does not simply provide a blank background, the, amb the ambiguity of reality on which action takes place, but makes us aware of the connection between the individual and the group and the scale of the consequences an individual action may have. We are starting to get a better sense of the kind of work realism does for Bazin. We can say that when Roir takes his film to say something about the social relations between both persons and classes, their differences, similarities, and interactions in a public sphere. The mere existence of the film gives these relations a physical reality. The work of style is to generate a social fact by taking up an attitude towards physical reality, showing it in a particular way. As Bazin notes, realism is a way of, quote, giving reality meaning, end quote, J.R. page 84. It is crucial for my reading of Bazin that he describes Renoir's style as pertaining only to a specific form of realism that gives a particular interpretation of reality. Bazin argues, block quote, the word, quote, realism, end quote, as it is commonly used, does not have an absolute and clear meaning so much as it indicates a certain tendency toward the faithful rendering of reality on film. Given the fact that this movement toward the real can take a thousand different routes, the apologia for, quote, realism, end quote, per se, strictly speaking, means nothing at all. The movement is valuable only insofar as it brings increased meaning itself in abstraction to what is created. J.R. page 85, end of block quote. He identifies Wenrar's quote genius, end quote, 
as the ability to bring a specific increase of meaning to an image of reality, to add something new to the reality, to give it an interpretation. The way Renoir does this defines his realism, but his alone. We cannot make it a more general model. Along with Renoir's films of the 1930s, Italian neorealism is frequently cited as the style that most clearly fits Bazin's conception of realism. On the standard reading, Bazin is seen as holding the position Cesare Zavatini advocated, with neorealism as a cinema of authenticity, almost an anti-cinema designed to correspond as closely as possible to the world the films are about. Even when the fictional location isn't the real place of filming, there is an effort to provide an impression of authenticity and maintain a kind of, quote, fidelity, end quote, to reality. A typical list of neorealist features includes location shooting, the use of non-professional actors, contemporary political and social themes, technical roughness, and an episodic narrative form. There are places where Bazin talks about neorealism in exactly these terms. As in his discussion, as in his discussions of Vittorio De Sica's The Bicycle Thieves, 1948. That film, Bazin argues, lives up to, quote, the most exacting specifications of Italian neorealism. Not one scene shot in a studio. Everything was filmed in the streets. As for the actors, none had the slightest experience in the theater or film, end quote. And, quote, no more actors, no more story, no more sets, which is to say that in the perfect aesthetic illusion of reality, there is no more cinema, end quote. This interpretation is generally taken to stand in for Bazin's view of neorealism more broadly. But if we look at his other writings on neorealism, it turns out to pertain only to De Sica and Zavatini. Bazin says different things about other neorealist filmmakers, such as Federico Fellini, Roberto Rossellini, and Luciano Visconti. With Rossellini, for example, Bazin explicitly refuses criteria of authenticity. He claims that Rossellini's films do not progressively fall away from neorealism just because they exhibit quote, less concern for social realism for chronicling the events of daily life, end quote, quote, BT, end quote, 296. Bazin also rejects the elimination of professional actors as a necessary feature of neorealism, even in light of the controversy over Ingrid Bergman's presence in Stromboli. 1949. Generally, when neorealist filmmakers used actors, they were not familiar with, or they were not familiar face, faces. Generally, when neorealist filmmakers used actors, they were not familiar faces, and most were cast as with Anne Magnani and Aldo Fabrici in Rome Open City 1946 in roles they did not ordinarily play. Bergman, however, was already an international superstar and could under no circumstances be mistaken for a non-professional actor. 
Her presence was generally seen as introducing an unacceptable element of artifice into Rossellini's films, but the issue simply does not register for Bazin. Even though he takes the role of non-professionals to be of real importance with the Sika. We find the logic behind Bazin's treatment of neorealism in an essay on Rossellini, where he argues that, quote, the term neorealism should never be used as a noun except to designate the neorealist directors as a body. Neorealism as such does not exist. There are only neorealist directors. End quote. Quote DR, end quote, 299, my emphasis. De Sica's aesthetic differs from Rossellini's and both differ from that of Fellini and Visconti. Because they each have their own style, Bazin suggests that they should be analyzed on their own terms. In refusing to treat neorealism as a noun, Bazin is also saying that neorealism is not a list of things or a set of criteria that must be satisfied. Neither the content of the films nor an authentic relation between the fictional in the world in the real world defines it. Instead, neorealism is a verb, an activity, a particular aesthetic relation that follows general contours but is specific to each filmmaker and film. It denotes an attitude the filmmaker takes toward reality itself. Quote, its realism is not so much concerned with the choice of a sub of subject as with a particular way of regarding things. End quote. D quote DR end quote 297. It is at this point in his argument that Bazin introduces a new term, the fact. In neorealist films, Bazin argues, reality is turned into facts. A fact is not simply a term that refers to particular objects, but to social phenomena as well. The relations a person has to the physical world, to other people, and presumably to institutions. A fact, at Bazin writes, is, quote, a fragment of concrete reality in itself, multiple and full of ambiguity, whose meaning emerges only after the fact, thanks to other imposed facts between which the mind establishes certain relationships, end quote. AR 237. We might say that a neorealist film starts with a particular fact that it treats as subject matter for the film, a sequence, or even a shot. It then constructs a style that functions as a response to that fact, a way of bringing out its meaning within the particular context in which it is placed. Although the rhetoric of facts suggests an exclusive concern with social reality, Bazin is explicit that facts are based on physical reality. In his defense of Rossellini against his Italian critics, Bazin returns to the terms of the quote, ontology, end quote, essay. A, quote, photograph is not an image of reality. There is ontological identity between the object and its photographic image, end quote. Quote DR, end quote, 298. Neorealism, 
then constitutes a particular mode of responding to and articulating facts while respecting the reality of objects in the image. Elsewhere, Bazin describes this achievement as the refusal to impose a viewpoint on reality. Quote, the originality of Italian neorealism as compared with the chief schools of realism that preceded it and with the Soviet cinema lies in never making reality the, the servant of some a priori point of view, end quote. Facts do not enter a film with a pre-existed meaning that is simply produced. They emerge in the way style confers new signification on physical reality. Bazin describes Rossellini as in, quote, a posteriori, end quote, filmmaker, one who presents reality and then takes a stance towards it. He writes, quote, the art of Rossellini consists in knowing what has to be done to confer on the facts of what is at once their most substantial and their most elegant shape. Not the most graceful, but the sharpest in outline, the most direct or the most trenchant, end quote, quote, DR, end quote, two, 101. It is not about reflecting the world, but taking its reality and using sound and image to give it meaning. Bazin often describes this as a dialectic between the concrete and the abstract, the physical level of reality, and the style that gives it meaning. See, quote, DR, end quote, 2, 101, JR, page 84, and quote, E, end quote, 139. Even at the basic level of the shot, reality is presented and an attitude and interpretation is taken. To get a better sense of how this mechanism works, we will have to look in detail at an example. Bazin rarely engages in close analysis, but filling in what an analysis might be on his terms will show how his conception of realism aids a descriptive account of the work done by a film. I want to turn then to the fact of Ingrid Bergman, or rather to what Rossellini understands that fact to be. He seems to believe that Bergman almost automatically poses the problem of existence in a world that is not only physical, but outside one's control. If Anna Magnani is at home amongst the physicality of objects, Bergman remains at a level of remove. Rossellini's insight is that an entire drama can be built out of her confrontation with the material stuff of the world. The change in Rossellini's use of Bergman from Stromboli to Viaggio in Italia, 1954, reveals something about his understanding of this fact. In the first film, she is pitted against the bleak harshness of the island and the sheer sub sublimity of its volcano. Rossellini stages her encounter with the physical world in almost hyperbolic terms. It is only after being nearly annihilated by the volcano that she is able to accept a world that infringes on her sense of self and her desire to be separate from the corporeality of her environment. By Viaggio in Italia, though Rossellini 
has become interested more in her relation to the physical world as such, a relation she brings out by placing her against ordinary, even innocuous objects. It is this more mundane treatment of Bergman's encounters with the world that structures the scene in Viaggio in Italia where Catherine Bergman encounters a series of statues at the Musee Museo Archaeologico Nazionale. Two aspects of its style are worth special attention. First, the camera is called to life by Catherine's gaze at the statues. Second, it does it does not so much replicate her look as articulate a specific relation between her and the stone figures. The first shot of the scene is from within the museum as Catherine and her guide enter through a gate in the background. The camera pans with them as they move across the frame to the right, the guide providing the history of the museum while Catherine looks around and then exit into the main hall. There is a dissolve to a close-up of an unidentified statue, the camera already in the process of pulling back from it. As it comes to a rest, the pair enters behind the statue and walk past from right to left. Catherine looks at it and, as she does so, the camera starts to track to the left as if following her. There is a flurry of slightly mysterious and fantastic music. This shot is worth attending to. The initial track backwards from the statue is unique in the sequence. The only camera movement that occurs before Catherine has looked at a statue. It seems to be doing two things. First, it announces the autonomy of the camera from the looks of Catherine and her guide. In the shots that allow her driving to the museum, our views of the city and its inhabitants were restricted to their perspective. The same constraints do not apply here. Second, it raises the question of what it is about these objects and about art objects in general that evokes such a response. Why is the camera called into motion here rather than when it looks at objects in the city or at other tourist locations? Question mark. The terms of Rossellini's answer center around the capacity of the statues to provoke Catherine's imagination, to allow her to depart from and, in a sense, to go beyond their physicality and the banality of the guide's remarks. The drama of the sequence is the way these flights of fantasy are motivated but not entirely determined by the sculptures. The potential for a failed encounter exists and, as we will see, the conditions for it are built into the sequence. Catherine's first encounter concludes as she, as she and the guide walk to the left towards a statue of a group of dancers. As she steps forward to get a better look, there is a cut to a closer shot of the dancers. The camera tra tracking to the right across the faces of four statues and then tilting down to reveal Catherine looking up at them. The camera not only displays the statues, but brings her and her act of looking into the frame as well. In a pattern that runs throughout the sequence, the camera's movement appears to be triggered by Catherine's gaze at a statue. We are shown a statue. She enters the frame and looks at and looks at it. The camera then begins to move around the object. 
as if articulating the tone of her look. The next two shots of the satyr and the drunken boy continue this pattern. The first starts with a close-up of the statue. The guide passes behind it, moving to the right and talking, and Catherine follows. As she enters, looking at the satyr, the camera starts to track and pan to the left around the statue, keeping her in the figure within the same frame. Rossellini shows us the stat the Rossellini shows us the structure and duration of their encounter. The second shot also begins with the guide moving behind a statue. Catherine enters, looks over at the statue, and the camera tracks in towards her, going over the body's head and swiveling to frame her briefly in a close-up from above with the guide in the background. It then continues around her head to reframe the statue from behind her position. Rossellini now begins to vary the pattern. There is a shot of Catherine walking directly at the camera, looking intently in front of her. A 180 degree cut leads to a quick track towards a statue of a discus thrower staring above the camera into the distance. The camera stops slightly beneath the statue, looking up at it. The shot, reverse shot, pairing generates a degree of intensity, almost suggesting that the statue looks back at her, or that it has, for Catherine at least, the capacity to do so. The power of these two shots then fades away as the next shot shows a longer view of her beside the statue as she starts to move away to the right. Its magic, its aura, question mark, is lost as her encounter with it comes to an end. Rossellini's camera registers the changing facts of the situation, not just by showing it, but by articulating a series of views that brings out these facts. The three subsequent shots show bust of different, different emperors. A wipe establishes the first shot. The camera tracks into the statue and pivots around it. The same movement, though not always with the forward glide, is found in each of the next two shots. The camera embraces the different shapes or looks of the heads. Although we never see Catherine actually looking at these busts, we understand the shots according to the logic of her previous encounters. In the movement or in the moment the camera starts to move, we infer the presence of her gaze. She is now looking. It's not that, as Sandro Bernardi suggests, these are, quote, false points of view, quote, false point of view shots, end quote. No person actually sees in this way, but they have a direct connection to her gaze. They are views inspired by the fact of her looking at and in response to the statues. The shots of the emperors also tell us something about how to read the sequence in general. The movement of the camera tells us how she reacts to the statues. It responds to and evokes her mood. Our understanding of Catherine is based on a set of inferences from present effects to absent causes from the movement of the camera to her psychological state. On the basis of what we see and 
how we see it. We grasp something internal to her. This logic is made explicit in the one encounter that fails. After the shots of the emperors, there is a cut to a stationary shot of a Venus, a reaction shot showing Catherine unmoved her irritation at the god's semi-flirtatious remarks. They remind her of the sexuality in the naked figure results in the failure of this encounter to provoke her imagination. She remains at the level of the physicality of the world, the corporeality associated with Stromboli, with sexuality, and we are struck or and we are stuck there with her. The stationary camera indicates the absence of the imaginative force that has been present so far. This is only an object, a thing with certain meanings associated with it. And yet, although the camera does not move, it is still responding to Catherine's look. She refuses to invest the Venus with new meaning and Rossellini brings this out with the stationary camera. The last two shots bring the sequence to a climax. The first shows the giant statue of the Fernice Hercules. Starting on the figure's right and slightly to its front, a framing that captures its bust, the camera swivels around. Okay, I'll read it back. Starting on the figure's bust, right and slightly to its front, a framing that captures its bust, the camera swivels around in a crane shot to a position behind and above the statue, thereby also reframing the guide and Catherine looking at it. The camera then slowly pulls back and settles into a stationary position. As it does, Catherine turns away to walk over to another statue in the background. In no other shot in the sequence is the encounter between her and a statue given such a dramatic handling. The movement of the camera traces the massive dimensions of the figure, investing it with a physical sen sensuousness that mirrors her exclamation, quote, oh, it's wonderful, exclamation point, end quote. If Catherine is overwhelmed by the physical imposition of the statue, she returns to herself in an imaginative act of encompassment. She is able to proclaim a judgment on the statue, albeit a trite one. The final shot of the sequence shows several figures struggling with a bull. The camera tracks into the bull's head moves left to frame a figure at the right or at the far right of the group and then tilts down and pivots to reveal others underneath. Continuing onwards, it travels to the right across the front to show a dog looking up at the scene. Here, embedded in the final statue is a kind of allegory for the sequence as a whole. Rossellini's mode of expression is based around a series of visual encounters, a figure outside the event looking in and responding to it. The structure of the museum sequence in Viaggio in Italia emerges from Rossellini's weighing up, judging and interpreting the fact of Bergman's physical and imaginative encounter with each statue. The structuring principle concerns the kinds of shots or modes of expression that best present the physical reality and social situation. On Bazin's terms, <clears throat> 
This accounts as a neorealist sequence because the fact emerges not as a structure imposed on the world or assumed to be already present, but as a form that responds to and in doing so defines its objects. Rossellini produces a luminous, a quote, luminous mold, end quote, of the facts, a gesture adapted to their shape that serves to bring them out in greater relief. Four, realism as acknowledgement. So far, the difference between standard and revised models of Bazin's realism has to do with the description and analysis of canonical realist films. If this were all, it might be possible to suitably modify the standard reading, but there are deeper issues here. On the one hand, we have Bazin's commitment to the realism of film as following from the ontology of the photographic image. On the other, we have a variety of styles that require an account that shows how and in what way Bazin thinks of them as realist. These are styles like Bresson's spiritualism and the Vasiliev brothers' Marxism that seem not to be predicated on a relation to visual or even physical reality. The task is to devise an account of how Bazin uses realism that accounts for both aspects of the term. The standard reading can resolve this tension in one of two ways. The simplest is to ignore the moments when Bazin discusses, quote, realist, end quote, styles that do not fit the conditions of direct or perceptual realism. But this leaves too much of Bazin's critical work unaccounted for. The other option is to deny the consideration that considerations of ontology are central to Bazin's realism. This has at least the virtue of intellectual honesty. A sophisticated version of this position will note that Bazin himself insists on the connection between ontology and style, but will argue that it is a theoretical mistake to do so and that his arguments about films and stylistic movements are best understood apart from the ontological considerations, C.C., page 45. Henderson has made the most extensive argument in this regard, dividing Bazin's work between systems of ontology and criticism, and then within that latter field between ontological and historical criticism. Henderson tries to show that when examined, the two systems turn out to be irreconcilable and that the range of Bazin's criticism does not follow from or respond to the ontological arguments. He writes, quote, the history system involves far more complex multifaceted judgments as a structure of thought. It is also far more difficult and complex than the ontology system. It is not derivable from the ontology system, in quote, see page 38. The advantage of Henderson's account is that it is able to cover the range of styles that Bazin calls realist. He writes, quote, it is not the term, quote, realism, in quote, itself, but how Bazin qualifies that term that is the center of the critical act. Realism becomes the name of the problem to be solved, a kind of X. Realism is Bazin's touchstone 
or basic critical concept, but it remains in itself a blank or open term, end quote. C, page 45. Certainly, the openness of realism is the feature of Bezin's argument that is usually ignored by the standard reading. Henderson's argument, though, fails on two accounts. First, Bazin does not think that just any film can be realist. To his eyes, German Expressionism is not, or German Expressionism is certainly not, and neither is Soviet cinema, sometimes. Second, the absence of the role of ontology comes at a cost. The trouble is not simply exegetical. The ontology of the photographic image is central to the productive tension between style and reality that lies at the heart of Bezin's understanding of realism. Bezin writes, quote, to define a film style, it is always necessary to come back to the dialectic between reality and abstraction, between the concrete and the ideal, end quote. J.R. page 84. It is only by paying attention to the relation between style and ontology that we can discern why Bazin thinks certain films can't or certain films to be realist in the first place. The initial definition of realism given above involved a film constructing a style that gives a meaning or significance to the physical reality it presents, turning it into facts. I've described this process in a set of loose phrases. The film, quote, responds to, end quote, quote, takes into account, end quote, or, quote, takes an attitude towards, end quote, the reality of objects in the images. I want to collect these under the general heading of acknowledgement, a concept that allows us to link the two aspects of realism together, its ontological foundation and its aesthetic variety. The idea of acknowledgement is developed in Stanley Cavall's early work. In contrast to simply knowing something, for example, that someone is in pain, acknowledging it involves actually doing something with the knowledge, responding to it in some way. Cabal writes, quote, acknowledgement goes beyond knowledge, goes beyond not, so to speak, in the order of knowledge, but in its requirement that I do something or reveal something on the basis of that knowledge, end quote. Cavell leaves the terms of this acknowledgement open, a troubling feature for a concept that is supposed to be foundational for ethical practice. Sadism, for example, could be seen as relying on a perverse acknowledgement of another's pain. But what makes it problematic for ethics is exactly what is of value for aesthetics. The open-endedness of acknowledgement means that it avoids being defined as a particular set of terms, emphasizing instead the process by which a relation between style and reality is generated. It doesn't specify the content of the relation so much as the specific mechanism that it produces. Michael Fried has provided the most extensive application of acknowledgement to aesthetics, using it to describe how certain modernist artists construct works, construct works in response to what they take to be the features, quote, that cannot be escaped, end quote, of their medium. Freed notes that for artists such as Kenneth Nolan and Jules Olitsky, quote, the continuing problem of how 
to acknowledge the literal actor of the support of what counts as the acknowledgement has been at least as crucial to the development of modernist painting as the fact of its literal literalness." End quote. The nature of the medium becomes the basis for the artwork. The work of the artist is to figure out the appropriate given the particular situation of the work. In a tradition, in a, in a society of acknowledging it, Acknowledgement gives us a conceptual framework for conceiving how film can be oriented by its medium and at the same time produce a style that is not, strictly speaking, faithful to it. Recall Bazin's claim that an object in a photograph is ontologically identical to the object in the world, however murky this idea may be. This is the basic feature of photographic media, their, quote, deep convention, end quote. A film, if it is to be realist, must construct a style that counts as an acknowledgement of the reality conveyed through its photographic base. It must do something in some way or another with this knowledge of its medium. But what it does is left open for individual films to achieve. In the acknowledgement, a film produces a particular reading in articulation or interpretation of the reality in the photograph, thereby generating what Bazin, in his discussion of neorealism, calls a fact, a social fact, a political or moral fact, a spiritual fact, an existential fact, and so on. This argument requires a distinction in the way Bazin talks about reality that is implicit, though not overt, in his writings. On the one hand, there is the brute or physical reality of objects in a photograph. On the other, there is what the film takes as its reality, which is already the result of the acknowledgement of physical reality. It is the latter use of reality that I have used the term fact to denote. The facts created in the acknowledgement can pertain to an understanding of social reality, Renoir, or they can demonstrate a certain feature about the world and one's existence in it, Rossellini. The kinds of facts developed, the second level of reality, are the forms the acknowledgement of physical reality takes. This is the mechanism underlying Bazin's theory of realism. The framework of acknowledgement allows us to see that Bazin's refusal to define, quote, the real, end quote, is not, as Henderson argues, a crucial failing for realism but its greatest strength, see page 18. It leaves the stylistic resources of realism open despite the grounding in the ontology of the photographic image. We cannot determine from contemplation of the medium itself what a realist style can be, nor is it the case that there is only one fact that can be acknowledged by a given artwork, or only one way of doing the acknowledging. As Freed notes, quote, what in a given instance will count as acknowledgement remains to be discovered, to be made out, end quote. The task is to discover from looking at a film what it is that its style is acknowledging, what it takes the fact of the film to be, and whether that involves doing something with the knowledge of its ontological foundation. Satisfying the latter condition brings the film under the general heading of realism. The form in acknowledgement takes specifies its kind of realism,
one of the strengths of the revised model of realism is its ability to cope with films that go beyond the film slash reality correspondence of the standard reading. Take Bazin's description of the final image of Bresson's Diary of a Country Priest. A white background with the black outline of a cross and a text being read over it. He writes, quote, the screen free of images and handed back to literature is the triumph of cinematographic realism, end quote, quote, SRB, end quote, 1, 141. There seems to be a paradox here. Given the ontology of the photographic image, how are we to make sense of this claim that the lack of images, the very absence of physical reality is the triumph is the quote triumph end quote of realism question mark Bazin's argument as I understand it is twofold first the realism of the shot in the film involves the problem of showing spiritual grace or transcendence on film Bazin is explicit throughout his career that genuinely religious cinema will not show this in visual terms since grace does not have a physical manifestation. physical manifestation. No external criteria can be determined or can determine who is saint and who isn't. Thus, since film is indelibly connected to the physical, Bazin will argue that the spiritual existence Bresson is interested in cannot be shown. As an inner state, it cannot take interior exterior form. It cannot take exterior form. What Bresson does, as Bazin sees it, is give us the spiritual state and at the same time acknowledge the ontology of the medium by negating the visual dimension of the image. Because negation is not simple denial, but a moment in a dialectic that implies the existence of the term being negated, there is still a relation to the physical reality, despite the absence of filmed images. Negation is not incompatible with acknowledgement. Bazin writes, quote, the black cross on the white screen as awkwardly drawn as on the average memorial card, the only trace left by the quote assumption end quote on the image is a witness to something the reality of which is itself but a sign end quote quote SRB end quote one 141. In the moment of the priest's transcendence, becoming a saint as it were, Bresson turns physical reality itself into a mere sign, suggesting that what is happening is something that cannot be shown. It is spiritual, not of this world. Second, Bazin argues that the film is not just about the inner salvation of a priest, but about the relation of a film to literature. The screen is, quote, handed back to literature, end quote, specifically the Barnanos novel on which it is based. He writes, quote, in this case, the reality is not the descriptive content, moral or intellectual of the text. It is the very text itself, or more properly, the style, end quote. Quote SRB, end quote, 1, 136. 
In saying that the film takes the text itself to be reality, Bazin depends on the distinction I've argued for. An adapted text does not have physical reality in the film. In this case, it seems like a metaphysical entity, but is a part of second order reality, a fact. To make this explicit, Bazin qualifies himself and says that the reality that has to do with the text is not brute reality, but the reality of the style, that is, the already interpreted reality. Bresson enacts a, quote, dialectic between fidelity and creation. It is a question of building a secondary work with the novel as foundation. It is a new aesthetic creation, the novel, so to speak, multiplied by cinema, end quote. Quote SRB, end quote, 1, 141 through 142. By negating the image and retaining the voice, Bresson articulates the prominence of word over image and thus novel over film. In order to make sense of this and similar discussions in Bazin's work, realism cannot be limited and closed set of styles. What is at work is a relation between style and reality, but this can take many forms. Even films like Diary of a Country Priest that depend on a non-visual style still acknowledge by way of negation the physical reality that objects in a photographic image have. With Hitchcock, a filmmaker he isn't fond of, Bazin argues that the narrative itself is taken to be part of the basic material of the world. Quote, it is not merely a way of telling a story, but a kind of a priori vision of the universe, a predestination of the world for certain dramatic connections, end quote. Hitchcock's work concerns how best to establish a relation to this stuff, to make it explicit, to acknowledge that the film is about the way in which the story is told, the dramatic movement itself. Hence, the importance of suspense. Hitchcock is described as a purveyor of a, quote, light realism, end quote, with delicacy of touch that serves as a counterpoint for the metaphysical status of narrative. Bazin's conception of realism opens up the wide range of ways in which physical reality is caught up in and mixed with rational discursive and spiritual facts and the styles that generate them. If we apply, the, if we apply his definition of neorealism to his own theory, we might say that realism for Bazin is not a noun, not any one thing, but an open set of styles that fall under a general heading because of a shared mode of approach, a way of interpreting in acknowledgement reality. Five, objections, inadequacy, and negative judgments. I can see two basic objections to this reading of Bazin. One is that it is inadequate because there are significant moments in Bazin's work where he proposes a different model of realism. Second, and more seriously, if it turns out to be the case that most films can be read to fall under the heading of realism, how do we account for Bazin's desire to say that certain styles, such as Soviet montage, and German Expressionism are not realist, question mark. Does Bazin have valid grounds for negative judgments, question mark? 
The most important source for the inadequacy objection is Bazin's essay, quote, the evolution of the language of cinema, end quote. Though examples can be found elsewhere where he draws a distinction between, quote, two broad and opposing trends, end quote, in film history. On the one side are realists who, quote, put their faith in reality, end quote. On the other, anti-realist who, quote, put their faith in the image, end quote, quote, E, end quote, 124. Bazin's distinction centers on the location and fixity of a film's meaning. Bazin argues that with F.W. Murnau, quote, the composition of his image is in no sense pictorial. It adds nothing to the reality. It does not deform it. Or the quote, the composition of his image is in no sense pictorial. It adds nothing to the reality. It does not, not deform it. It forces it to reveal its structural depth to bring out the pre-existing relations which become constitutive of the of the drama, end quote, or with Eric von Stroheim, quote, reality lies or re, quote, reality lays itself bare like a suspect confessing under the relentless examination of the commissioner of police, end quote, quote E, end quote, one twenty seven. The contrast is with montage-based style. Quote, montage as used by Khrushchev, Eisenstein, and or, or Gantz did not show the event. It alluded to it. The final significance of the film was found to reside in the ordering of these elements from reality much more than in their objective content, end quote, quote, E, end quote, 125. If realism allows the full ambiguity of reality to come through, expressionism and montage aesthetics artificially fix its meaning through stylistic impositions. Consider, however, the ambitions of the essay. It is first of all a historical argument analyzing, quote, broad trends, end quote, rather than individual films. Bazin posits the historical development of cinema as culminating in what he sees as a contemporary turn to a form of realism that involves styles based on resemblance to reality. Social realism of the 1930s, American as well as French, and post-war neorealism. These styles tend, quote, to give back to the cinema a sense of the ambiguity of reality, end quote, quote, E, end quote, 137. But this is not a contradiction of my reading of his realism. Bazin's defense of the, quote, ambiguity, end quote, of reality can easily be read to fall under the more flexible model for certain interests in reality as with 1930s and 1940s social realism. The standard readings version of realism counts as acknowledgement. The quote evolution end quote essay has a more specific ambition, however, and that is to defend sound cinema as a valid aesthetic form. Bazin is trying to rescue sound cinema and realist cinema more generally from theorists who treated silent film as the pinnacle of film art because of its distance or separation from reality. Rudolf Arnheim is an effective representation of such theories. Quote, film will be able to reach the heights of the other arts only when it frees itself from the bonds of photographic reproduction and becomes a pure work of man, namely as animated cartoon or painting, end quote. Arnheim believes that it is a historical fact of cinema that expressionism and to some extent montage films as well 
dies out with synchronized sound by pinning the image down to a reference sound prevents the kind of of abstraction such films employed the growing prominence of sound in cinema means that film loses aesthetic resources and moves far farther away from becoming an authentic art bazin agrees that sound ties film more closely to a referent and also that this precludes a range of aesthetic forms but unlike arnheim he does not see this as a decline realism is understood to be the telos of cinema with sound helping to bring out what was there all along end quote undoubtedly the talkie sounded the nil of a certain aesthetic of the language of film but only wherever it had turned its back on its vocation in the service of realism end quote quote e end quote 138 it is as if in order to respond to writers like arnheim bazin has to identify cinema's aim with a realism predicated on resemblance to reality my sense is that bazin winds up winds up overstating his case even on his own terms we can see this in the way he talks about eisenstein in the quote evolution in quote essay eisenstein is opposed to the realistic school of filmmaking if filmmakers like dreyer stroheim murnau and flaherty constitute the realistic tendency of the silent period prefiguring the dominant aesthetic of sound cinema eisenstein is in the other camp quote the creation of a sense or meaning is not objectively contained in the images themselves but derived exclusively from their juxtaposition in quote quote e in quote 125 but bazin equates eisenstein with dreyer at other points and elsewhere links the quote search for realism that characterized the russian films of eisenstein pudovkin and dovchenko as revolutionary both in art and politics end quote to the ambitions of neorealism quote ar end quote 2 16. Bazin's strongest praise of Eisenstein comes in an early review of Ivan the Terrible. He argues that it ranks, quote, far above the best films from around the world that have been shown on French screens since the liberation, end quote, but has trouble saying why since, quote, the film returns to the most conventional aesthetics of silent film, thus renouncing 15 years of realistic cinema, end quote. Bazin can't bring himself to like the film's style, but he is sure that Eisenstein has made a great film. Quote, one is certainly entitled to consider the path Eisenstein takes in Ivan the Terrible as an offensive return to a dangerous aestheticism. But such a hypothesis doesn't in itself give us leave to disregard the extraordinary mystery of its titan of the cinema the genius of his camera in this his latest film end quote quote b end quote page 202. what is striking is that bazin tries to analyze ivan with the tools of realism at the end of the review he puts forward a hypothesis that the film has such extravagant and baroque gestures because it is attempting to exhibit to put on display the fact that it is meant to serve a political enterprise quote eisenstein may have consciously chosen a style for his film that rejected psychological realism from the start and that required for its own aesthetic realization the systematic magnification of a thesis that is the elaboration of a thesis without benefit of nuance and quote quote b and quote page 203. this argument 
follows the model of realism as acknowledgement. Eisenstein takes a certain fact as the point of his film, namely its status as propaganda and makes that the basis of his aesthetic. The style is then an articulation of the fact through the acknowledgement of the reality of the image. By negation, Eisenstein makes us aware of the kind of reality the images ought to contain. He demonstrates the lack of fit between the world of Ivan and, by analogy, the Stalinist world and the reality it is supposed to engage. There is, however, one group of bets in, or there is, however, one group of films bets in consistently designates as anti-realist, German Expressionist cinema. Here, there is no need to modify the claim in the quote evolution end quote essay. But if we take a careful look at Bezin's position, it is not clear that he has the right, given the critical tools at his disposal, to condemn what he calls quote the expressionist heresy, end quote, quote, AR, end quote, pay, or 226. This is the second objection, the problem of negative judgments. Bazin's complaint is that German expressionism, quote, did very kind or did every kind of violence to the plastics of the image by way of sets in lighting, end quote, advocating a primacy of the image at the expense of physical reality, quote, E, end quote, 126. Compare, quote, SRB, end quote, 139. Even before an image is made, these films replace the world with something artificial, something that bears no relation to reality. The sets of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, 1919, for example. Bezin's claim is that they have nothing to do with the ontology of the photographic image. They fail to acknowledge it. The problem with this argument is that it is not a good reading of German Expressionism. Acknowledgement can take place by negation, which we have Bezin which we have Bezin depend upon for his account of the final image of Bresson's Diary of a Country Priest. A similar argument might be made for an expressionist film. Cavell writes, block quote, suppose that the only point of reality in these films is the ultimate point in any film, namely the actors not a real animal or tree or sky or metal or body of water to be found. Then what happens is that the locales of such films are given a specialized psych psychological or spiritual interpretation. We interpret them as projections of the characters or some characters state of soul as their dreams, their fantasies, their madness. We interpret them in one direction or another, that is, as competing with our sense of reality. This means that the acting must be stylized as the location, dedicated by it, so to speak." End of block quote. If the fact of German Expressionism is the actors or characters and their states of mind, a removal of physicality from the world would follow from it. The style of Caligari then could be seen as acknowledging the, phys the non-physical nature of this fact by negating the physical reality of the world it shows, such as description is of a realist world. To combat this, Bazin would have to argue that German Expressionism constitu constitutes a denial rather than a negation of physical reality and thereby fails to present a mode of acknowledgement. If negation recognizes the physical reality carried by the image, denial simply ignores it.
The claim would be that while both Diary of a Country Priest and the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari do not present physical reality as such, the former does something with its knowledge of the ontology of the photographic image. The latter does not. It is dead, mute, lifeless. This line of argument might lead us to treat Bazin's understanding of realism as implying a flexible but finite field, a continuum with a limit on either end. One pole would be German Expressionism with its denial of reality. The other would be a certain picture of documentary film where reality is hypostasized hypostatized and isolated, simply accepted as being there rather than acknowledged. I don't think this picture is satisfactory. It may be the case that some expressionist films constitute a denial of physical reality, but there is no reason why Bazan should think that all expressionist films do so. The same holds for documentary films. As Bazin himself makes clear, discussing Kon Tiki, directed by Thor Her Herdahl, 1950, he argues that although the film takes as its reality the fact that, quote, the actors in the drama, end quote, were there, the images do not have documentary authenticity on their own. Instead, the structure of the film works to acknowledge this fact, quote, whenever something is significant, quote, whenever something of significance occurred, the onset of a storm, for example, the crew were too busy to bother running a camera, end quote, rather than a hypothesization of reality hypothetization of reality, we are given a subtle engagement with it that generates an interpretation, a fact. Similar arguments could be made about other doc documentary films. It's not clear that Bazin has the resources with which to make negative judgments. <clears throat> One possibility would be to base such judgments on criteria of coherence and consistency, as Bazin does with Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt, 1943. Quote, the writer and director obviously did not have the courage to follow their intent to the end, end quote. We could also think of negative judgments in terms of quality, whether a film expressed its acknowledgement with subtlety, elegance, or dexterous, dexterousness. But these options are neither robust or, or nor critically exciting. And if we want to say that a film is bad, poorly made, barbarous, or uninteresting, that does not necessarily mean it fails to be realist on Bazin's terms. We might also concede that Bazin was simply unable, for whatever reason, to treat German Expressionism with the kind of attention and complexity it deserves. The real difficulty, however, is more general. If the criterion for Bazin's dismissal of a film is that it does not, in some sense, acknowledge the fact that what is shown is in some sense real, there may be no films that on a symp sympathetic reading, failed to do this. Bazin depends on the notion of realism to mark a specific feature of the way certain films work. If realism for Bazin is to be more than a rough synonym for films he likes, if it is meant to specify the kind of work only some films do, then it cannot be the case that adequate, adequately described by adequately described any film can be read 
to fall under the heading of realism. Once negation is included within the critical vocabulary of realism and a number of Bezin's arguments cannot do without it, it is difficult to think of how a film could fail to acknowledge the ontology of the photographic image. If, Bezin, if Bezin's conception of realism, as so many critics assert, does not live up to its own ambitions, it falls short on very different terms and for very different reasons than is commonly assumed. The problem is not that it is too restrictive, that it is founded on and so only recognizes a limited set of similar styles. Instead, realism now seems applicable to any and every film. Bazin at one point even hints at bringing animation under its aegis or ages. But this does not render realism tautological or irrelevant. There are other things it does than just provide criteria for classifying films as realist or non-realist. The work internal to a film that it helps us to see is vital to providing compelling accounts of what matters to a film and how this is shown. Conclusion I have been struggling against an established picture of Bazin, one which takes him to advocate a realism based on fidelity to an antecedent reality. It is a view on which realism is marked by the absence of stylization. According to this view, Bazin has an a priori set of criteria. Long takes, deep space, respect for the integrity of a scene, ambivalent meaning against which he measures in individual film. A film status as a realist work depends on the extent to which it satisfies these criteria. I have tried to set out an alternative understanding of Bezin's realism. Rather than marking out a set of features, realism describes the specific attitude a film takes to. On the one hand, the ontological basis of its medium, and on the other, what the film holds as its central facts. I argue that we could be best conceive I argue that we could best conceive this model in terms of acknowledgement and that doing so allowed us to see that what is being acknowledged by the film is only discovered by an investigation of its style. In Viaggio in Italia, for example, the movements of the camera tell us that the physical confrontation of Ingrid Bergman and her imagination with the statues is at stake and not, say, mere tourism. Realism becomes, in Bazin's work, an analytical tool, one that can get at the way a film works. A final point, I have avoided an external reading whether historical or ideological, of Bezin's writing. To engage these concerns directly would take us too far off topic. Still, what this essay should show is that, insofar as we treat Bezin's aesthetic as based on a moral or political foundation, we shouldn't take him to hold some set of implicit and abstract commitments. Instead, we can think of Bazin as committed to a specific movement from image to reality. What we learn by watching and responding to films, films that are realist in the appropriate way, can be transferred to the way we engage reality. Bazin's moral imperative for films and film criticism goes something like this. It is only with things outside ourselves, things that stand freely 
of our capacity to impose an order on them that we can establish meaningful kinds of relations, even if that involves their transcendence at, as with Bresson. If film teaches us, quote, to have a regard for reality, end quote, quote DR, end quote, to 101, it does so by showing us something new about it, something worthy of our attentiveness and as Bazin often says, our love. And I was reading Rethinking Bazin, Ontology and Realist Aesthetics by Daniel Morgan, Source, Critical Inquiry, Volume 32, Number 3, Spring 2006, pages 443 through 481, published by the University of Chicago Press.